How's it going, my friend? Today, I am here with my friend Craig, and we're going to be talking about his podcast, his illustrator career, as well as dealing with the growing pains that come whenever you are expanding your creative offering to the world. And we're going live right now. Hello, everybody. I am Ryan Rhodes, and I am here today with my friend Craig Rasmussen. How are you, sir? Doing well. How are you, Ryan? Doing good, man. Craig is the founder and operator at monkeygong.com. He is a podcaster, illustrator extraordinaire, and today we're going to be talking about growing pains and solutions because whenever you're doing any kind of creative thing, inevitably you start running into... Uh, let's say roadblocks whenever you're trying to expand your creative <clears throat> offering. So yeah. I am the creative director and founder at reformdesigns.biz. We run a design agency based in Salem, Oregon, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. So Craig, why don't you introduce yourself, say hello, and talk a little bit about what it is that you do, and then we'll get right into it. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Rasmussen. I'm a comic book illustrator. I specialize in science fiction and fine art illustration as well outside of comic books. Uh, currently working uh, or jumping into a large uh, coffee table art book illustration job in addition to the science fiction branding work that I'm doing for my own brand at monkeygong.com. And monkeygong.com is my website, also known as Monkey Gong Productions. Uh, <clears throat> that is the publishing brand for all of my comic book work that I do for myself. And uh, that is also the, uh, the uh, production label for both of my podcasts, including the Storycraft podcast, where I talk to professional storytellers of all brands, uh, be it film, comedy, comics, journalism, science, whoever is using story in any way they're using it in their job. Uh, and then the other podcast is the Repeat Viewing Podcast, where my friend Seamus Smith and I, a very longtime friend of mine uh, and companion through thousands of hours of cinema viewing, uh, we talk about the art and psychology of why people rewatch movies. So sometimes it's terrible movies that people just can't stop rewatching and loving due sheerly to nostalgia in some cases, in our opinion. Uh, <clears throat> see the most recent episode of Clue versus Game Night for more details on what's, that what's, and uh what's your favorite uh what's your favorite terrible movie to rewatch i always my go-to is probably highlander <laughs> you know because it's a, it's it's high concept and kind of cool but it's kind of awful at the same time but then there's also like this really great garage sensibility to the style of filmmaking so some of it really works so it's like got this real mix of you know like garbage and then you know high b cinema we'll say right <laughs> very so, cool how about you do you have a favorite oh man um i would probably say one that i've watched numerous times is um uh, peter jackson's dead alive uh, well yeah but he's got some skills man so i don't know they're pretty present in that movie yeah i mean bad, i guess bad in the sense of um just one of those things where you watch it and you're like i can't believe that this this is a thing, but sure, you know. <laughs> okay, I'll give I'll give you another one. Okay. Uh, Road Roadhouse, starring Patrick Swayze. Yeah, that's another good like, one. That movie is kind of terrible, but it's kind of eighties awesome. Yeah, you uh, know. So Brent, my friend Brent said, uh, "What about They Live?" That's another that's another excellent movie. Uh, well, They Live has become um, a masterpiece of prophecy, I think, and has uh, started to take its place in the canon of uh, great satire that's going to be. Uh, remembered as one of those things we didn't pay enough attention to at the time. <laughs> yeah, you're probably right on that. I think uh, Roddy Piper said on Twitter shortly before passing that They Live was a documentary. <laughs> no doubt. That's what it felt like when I watched it shortly after <clears throat> someone got elected to office. Yeah, we'll, we'll just not talk about that right now. But Yeah, that's the, uh, <laughs> the, the pregnant coffee pause right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not talking about politics, not nope. talking about politics. Nope. Hey, branding. So let's talk about branding. Let's talk about that. <laughs> so, okay, guys. So um, as always, if you have any questions, definitely drop them in the comments. We are streaming this live on Facebook. So if you are watching this live, um, if you would drop a comment right now and just write hashtag live, if you're watching it on the replay, just write hashtag replay. It helps us to create better content for you guys and figure out what it is, um, you know, who our audience is and when they're paying attention and that kind of thing. And so if you have comments or questions at any time, if you're watching live, definitely let us know and we'll do our best to answer them and um, 
other than that, we are gonna just jump right in here. So Craig, um, again, thanks for stopping by today. And um, where, are you, where are you based actually? Just curious real quick. I am based in Phoenix, Arizona with uh, regular outings to Los Angeles and uh, not quite as frequent to the Bay Area uh, where I get a lot of my recordings. And, okay. Uh, also creator interactions in general. Very cool. Uh, those, the desert is a wide open place and it's kind of hard to get together with other creators sometimes. Yeah, totally understand. Well, it's nice that we have the ability to defy the laws of time and space here and now because, mm -hmm. I mean, what is it? What's, what's the future like? You're, what, two hours ahead of me right now or something? I think we're on the same time zone until the time change this fall. Oh, we're only okay. an hour apart. Okay. All right. Well, um, so I guess getting right into this here, the, the first question that I have for you is, uh, as it pertains to podcasting, you know, what was it that made you decide to start your own podcast in the first place? And like, how long did you wrestle with the idea before you finally made the leap? Um, and so I guess put another way, what, what is your why? You know, what really what drives you? <laughs> I love that you said it that way, actually, because I, I occasionally have done seminars at comic book conventions, and I often point to the why. If someone has questions, um, I'm trying to start a little thing called Ask the Doc, actually, as in Ask the Document, which means find out what is the core why in the story that you're trying to make. You know, So for me, the why is always such a, a key nugget of information. So for me, uh, I feel like there was no way for me to learn what it is that I do before I started doing it. Um, I kind of started drawing comics, for instance, based on looking at comics, based on just reading comics. And, uh, you know, like many people in my generation, copying the style of the artwork in the 80s uh, and night late, uh, excuse me, the, the early 90s, specifically in comics, which maybe wasn't the best way to uh, foray into learning illustration. Uh, but it led me into, you know, more of the community element, which is where my learning really began. Because once you start drawing comics, the best way to figure out how to draw them better, I mean, sure, there are some books by Will Eisner and Scott McCloud, and there's a bunch of, you know, great stuff that you can get out of uh, just looking at people like Alex Toth or Mobius. Um, but they're really is no substitute for showing your work to a professional or showing your work to a publisher or an editor that works for a publisher because yeah they might completely destroy you and ruin your weekend at that comic book convention <laughs> but then you know a few weeks later once it's all sunk in you start to kind of realize okay i see what their point is yes my construction of my figures is weak or my storytelling kind of doesn't make sense or you know my page design is confusing or there's a lot of things like that that you can only get by talking to other creators, basically. Even if it's an editor, honestly, there's still someone that has a very creative eye on the storytelling process of comics. Um, so for me, the why, as far as the Storycraft podcast is concerned, and I kind of think I gave you an insight into the why for the repeat viewing podcast already, uh, but the storytelling, uh, the Storycraft podcast is based firmly on those creator conversations. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't until I had kind of become a podcast addict listening to and that's not a shout out to the app by the way uh i literally just you know kind of mainlined like the nerdist and kevin pollock's chat show and wtf with mark Marin and never not funny with jimmy pardo and most of them honestly were comedians doing podcasts and i really just wasn't finding that many podcasts where i felt like it was powerful creators and not i don't mean famous mm -hmm. by the way i mean successful in the sense that we'll talk about shortly uh and powerful in themselves and the discussions that we get to have, because I think there are some really amazing exchanges. And, and again, I've learned, honestly, I mean, despite going to art school for nearly five years, I learned almost everything I know from just the experience of doing and the experience of other people and learning it through watching them do it and having conversations. Right. So it seemed like an automatic podcast. Right. So you know? when did you, so whenever you were, I guess whenever you were listening to all these podcasts, like was was there a conversation that you started having with some of your your other creator friends where it's like, you know what, we have conversations like this. Like, why don't we just turn on a camera, turn on a microphone and and just see what happens? Or or was it more of like a, you know, I, I think that I can do this and I want to do this and I want to see about interviewing, connecting with other creators on my own? Well, I mean, the answer is yes, um, in both senses, I guess, because okay. uh, basically the phenomenon of the comic convention community that exists in my life and the lives of people who attend comic book conventions is unlike anything else. Because I think 
especially in this country, and I'm not getting political, I just think there's a, there's kind of a lack of tradition and there's a lack of community uh, that's well-defined. So that's why we see these big, you know, emergences of like the Burning Man community, for instance, where there's just people who crave like minds and like spirits and they just want to interact with each other. And, and so I really just started to find myself at comic book conventions having these conversations all the time. So it was sort of a question of... <clears throat> it was already happening for so long by the time I realized it could be a podcast that it was this huge slap in the face. And so the reason it's, uh, uh, the answer is yes on both counts is because I actually have, my first episode is Dave Crosland, who's a very talented illustrator and friend of mine in Southern California. Uh, he was kind of the person I was talking to at the Long Beach Comic Con, I think, or WonderCon, I can't remember. It was after a convention at some point and everything had just shut down. In fact, it might've even been New York. Hmm. Um, so again, there's, they all bleed together, you know, and it's like the only, <laughs> the only time you see your friends. So it's like weirdly feels like, like two weeks in a row, but they're separated by a year. Sometimes it's a really fascinating experience, but, uh, it's unbroken, you know, and that relationship is very strong and it's, it's so automatic. There's no pretense in that kind of a relationship. It's, it's everything that you would want to have instantly, you know, it's not like, Oh, I don't know. You know, like it's, there's no social awkwardness. It's instantly like, Oh man, the work you're doing is so great. I can't believe your Instagram feed. Right. Uh, so yeah. So I posted Dave as my first episode of the, <clears throat> the present incarnation. Cause there was a previous incarnation of the show, uh, strictly because quite frankly, he and I were having a conversation when the lightning bolts hit me. I was like, God, I love these conversations. I mean, I, he's one of my favorite people in the community and there's several others and you know his his buddy jim mafood is also somebody i i talked to uh very early in fact may have been my first actual podcast interview hmm. and uh if you listen to the interview with jim mafood in the feed it is a telephone interview back from when i used um oh, i can't remember what it was like pre-skype like no kidding so uh or at least pre-skype for me maybe and uh it was uh not bad you know, but it, it taught me a lot and it taught me I really wanted to have the creator conversation versus the nerd conversation. No offense, fellow nerds, because I'm definitely a nerd, but I want to get to the guts of how, to, how do we do this? How do we live this? Right. Well, I mean, so. it's, that, that's a, a really good um, that's a really good point, though, that you made about like the first one that you did was you, you're just on the phone. So, like, I mean, were you using an app to do that? Did you like have a microphone nearby a speakerphone or something like that? I'm, I'm always curious of just the practicals of how people well, get started with this stuff. I guess it wasn't pre Skype. I guess what I'm thinking is it was pre Zoom, which like what we're using now where Zoom generates an MP3 and sends it to you. Um, I was using freeconferencecall.com. It just crazy. So they did the same thing. So I basically, I still have my account. I still get emails from them every once in a while. Like, sure. kinda, you know, come on back kind of thing. It's like, why would I want to come back? It sounds like crap. Like everybody's <laughs> got digital technology now and I've right. got mics and stuff. Like, I don't need you. Go away. Right. Um, so it's really just a, a, a trial and error process. I mean, I recorded several of my first episodes all by myself. There were solo episodes into my iPhone via like this, you know, crappy mm -hmm. iPhone, you know, earbud microphone and they didn't sound great and you know they weren't terrible but you know solo episode is a different challenge than having a guest and having some structure so sure yeah very cool well i i really appreciate hearing some of those the the origin story so to speak because it gives a it gives people i think permission to start where they're at and one of the big things for me with with a lot of you know what we do and even even this episode of of this show um you know i changed the background from the last one and you know every episode it's like you you improve incrementally it's never like you just get to this place of oh i have now arrived but it's like every time you do a new episode or or talk with somebody else or connect with other creators you get new ideas for how to improve what you're already working on and i always love seeing that process with other people and hearing how they got started because a lot of times i don't know if you've run into this in your career but like you know people will ask us oh well you know how are you doing all this content and publishing books and you know releasing blog posts and all this other stuff it's like well i i initially got started with what i had and eventually you start figuring it out like you said as you go mm -hmm. so that uh plays very well into the you know ideal day structure that i know you'd like to talk about as well yeah, that's actually let's let's hop right into that. Um, yeah, you know, okay. one of the one of the questions I like to ask other creators is, you know, what does your ideal daily routine look like, and how close is that to your actual daily routine? <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll take the second part first, Alex. Uh, 
it's I'm 50 percent, maybe. Okay. And I'll say that uh, the 50 percent is uh, a large portion of the creative work that I would like to do. Like I'm I'm feeling pretty comfortable with the amount of creative work that I can put into a day, uh, but the other 50 percent is trying to make money off of that. There's a terrible habit that artists in particular have, and I'm sure writers can do this too, uh, or anybody who creates a particular, you know, just creative item or, you know, product, project, whatever you want to call it. It's very easy, uh, in my case, at least for, you know, art to do something great, really enjoy it, maybe post it on Instagram, but like there's no uh, pressing need to put it in the world. And so I just move on to the next drawing. But the problem is that if you move on to the next drawing, you're not doing anything to put that last drawing, so to speak, into the world. And so uh, that is the 50% I'm really kind of concentrating on now because it's, you know, the other 50% of getting where I want to be creatively has mostly been getting where I want to be creatively in terms of the quality of my work. Um, and now it's trying to figure out a little bit about the quantity of my work, trying to get, you know, a higher output. Um, but also that higher output is sort of this deceptive thing where it's kind of based as well on finishing the previous drawing and turning it into a project. You know what right. I mean? Because the output is only the, like the size of your output is a very, it, it belies the amount of work that you actually do. And, and like, right. like for instance, one of the greatest deceptions of my lifetime is the monthly comic book, the floppy comic with the staple in the binding, because it makes it look like people can crank out a comic in a month at that level every month. But I defy you to try it as an individual because it is a nearly impossible level of work. If you're working digitally, it's possible now there are enough shortcuts that people can get there. In fact, I know I know quite directly from firsthand stories that it is possible now, but it just, it kind of depends on your approach, but I'm talking well, it about- also may, It also depends on may, whether or not you have a team of people who are, who are right. behind you or, or if you're like really intensely disciplined. Correct, but it also depends on. Um, well, that is the that's the secret actually, which is what I was going to get to. Spoiler uh, <laughs> is that it's it's a production line. So really, the person everybody maybe is doing their portion of work in a month, sometimes less. But like, someone's doing pencil art, someone's doing ink art, then someone else coming in and doing color art, and then someone's doing letter art, and blah blah blah, and it goes on down the chain. So it, it is enabled to be produced that fast, but actually, it's still produced three or four months of he ahead of time at least sometimes even a year or more out, you know, sometimes these plans for these big companies is, you know, they are uh, woven for a very long time and they're all based on, you know, big marketing decisions and all that ahead of time as well. Sometimes at this point now tying into movies. So these decisions are being made sometimes years in advance now. And that is very deceptive if you're a comic book creator, because you want to have a monthly output because it's what you learned comics were i suppose like right. comics always were hey i gotta go pick up the new issue of batman or the newest amazing spider-man but that's not what comics really are and and in fact i think that's a very limited version of what they can be you know i think european comics are an amazing version of what comics can be because they just released this kind of like quarterly album or you were talking about the production line thing in japan they have a quarterly digest that is the size of a small phone book Wow. And typically this is because there's a, there's, a, there's a primary artist and then you have people who do backgrounds, you have people who do fill-ins, some of the inks are handled, you know, all kinds of stuff. Like this guy's really good at robots, so he comes in and draws robots, but that's how they do it there. But again, I am an independent creator and I want to draw my own stuff. And so there's all these different ways to go about this. And just like being an entrepreneur, or being a podcaster, it's all this trial and error and you got to figure out what way is best for you. Uh, because some people do flourish in the environment of monthly comics. I know several people who are very talented. In fact, most of the biggest people doing comics for biggest the biggest companies are, you know, somewhere in my circle of people. They may not be friends of mine, but they're friends of my friends. And you sit there and you see that they love to do this. And then I look at my work and I'm like, oh, I don't love to do the superhero thing. Right. I'm not down with the monthly structure. I want something it's more of a legacy. It's more of a library of my personal work. And I want to build a story, <clears throat> I guess, that is kind of epic and interconnected across my entire career. And I can't really do that if I'm drawing Spider-Man and then moving over and drawing like Supergirl and then moving over right. and, you know, doing something for image comics that's creator own. Cause then I can't string everything together cause I don't own everything, which right. is another, another part of this conversation, which is ownership. Sure. So very cool, man. Um, so in terms of, you know, 
I guess that's a, that's a really good segue. And uh, you're talking about the just the entrepreneurship aspect of it. Whenever you're creating your own thing and trying to get it out there and and you know make money with it, make a living with it, um, as opposed to just doing uh, contract work for somebody else's project. You know, how do you how do you find that you overcome the struggles that we all face as creators and entrepreneurs? Because you know, I I don't do comic book art, but I mm-hmm. do. You know, I, I do branding, I do websites, I, you know, I work on stuff for other people, but I'm also writing and publishing my own books. It's like, I just published this book um, a couple, about a month ago, um, and now I'm working on, and the reason that, it, it's actually green, but I'm in a green screen room. If For those of you who gotcha. don't know, we're, we're not actually in a cartoon. Um, this is, you know, this is a green screen room. But, um you know, now I'm working on not just the client work that I'm doing, but also getting the word out about this. And so, you know, I've got my own little tips and tricks and things that I do. A lot of it just boils down to making sure that I write down the stuff that I'm, I need to get done and the things I want to get done. But, you know, what are some of the ways that you overcome the struggles that you run into in this, in this space? Well, I mean, you know, you started the question uh, by referring to taking clients and then also being an entrepreneur. So for me, that is actually the chief struggle and has been for a while now. Um, I have found it honestly quite unrealistic to have somebody pay me to do comics simply because most people don't offer a high enough page rate and it is usually paid by the page uh, versus regular illustration, which is mind-boggling and that's largely because of the amount of artwork that goes into a comic the amount of pages and also the fact that once someone hires you to do a comic then it's upon their shoulders to pay to print the comic if they're trying to do this all independently which means that they really have to offer the artist i suppose less money i just you know wish that wasn't the case but it's untenable it's just not survivable and so i have found over time that i'm, I'm getting more work uh in the background in movies doing storyboards and doing some design work um currently working as the art director on something that's very cool uh, called The Dead Remember. And I just put up the website, thedeadremember.com. You can check out the pitch package for that. Uh, Very interesting supernatural horror film that's all based on some Native American lore that's super creepy. And it's a lot of fun. So I'm I'm just kind of embracing what is working, I guess. I guess that is the best uh, clean answer I can give you without giving you another five minute story. Uh, You know, I'm a podcaster. I can't give short answers. Uh, I, I recognized a few years ago, like I said about superheroes, that it's not my thing. And it's not that I'll never do it, but I have recognized that science fiction has always been my thing. If I go back to what I loved the most as a kid, I ran around dressed like Luke Skywalker when I was like four. You know what I mean? Like my mom could not get me out of the black pajamas kind of thing. Sure. Like Return of the Jedi era, dark Luke, like, you know, right on the edge of the dark side, but not too dark, just dark enough. Right. And, uh, <laughs> And so, you know, that informed my sensibilities a lot. And I I really didn't uh, give it credence until I was just failing at trying to get into the superhero game. Hmm. And at that point, I don't know, something struck me. I think I was just realizing like, oh God, I've really watched the Alien quadrilogy quite a few times recently and Star Wars, you know, I watched that twice a year, including two of the three prequels and, uh, and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So I just kind of, the writing was on the wall in that case. So I followed science fiction. And so now, uh, the writing is kind of on the wall that like science fiction is really working for me. Uh, I I'm getting approached a lot more regularly by people for contract work and just, you know, general interest in things. Um, and I feel like my interest in cinema in general is probably recognizable in my work, I suppose. So I'm getting people who are approaching me directly for stuff that's, you know, related in that sense, too. Uh, so I just think you got to kind of follow. It's a very Taoist approach, honestly, sure. which, you know, the Tao Te Ching, you asked about a great book. And I will tell you the Tao Te Ching, as translated by Stephen Mitchell, which is the Tao, if uh, I'm, I'm pronouncing it like I'm American. Um, <laughs> which is it just means the way and the ethics of nature and nature doesn't really fight back against itself if you think about it. So it's really right. kind of about let, let it rain if it's raining, let it be windy if it's windy, let you know, let, let something that's not working go away hmm. and follow the thing that is working. Yeah. Find something that you know feels good to you, feels comfortable because um, you can't really be successful if you're not doing something that you love, I don't think. I mean, I, I think you can be financially rewarded well and that can sort of emulate success. But I kind of feel like there are lots of stories of people who are coming full circle on that to discover that they are not fulfilled. Right. Well, that's that's actually a really great segue into to my next question here. Um, you know, you talk about 
the, I feel like a lot of people who aren't exposed to or in regular connection with people that are, uh, how do I say it, like typically looked at as successful, um, mm-hmm. a lot of times people think, well, you know, money equals success. And, you know, you hear all the time and people who have have climbed the mountain and, you know, achieved all their goals, but then the way that they did it either they weren't happy with how they got there or they're not happy doing the work that they're doing. And so, you know, how do you define success and who are some people that you look up to as successful and why? Uh, I mean, I'd have to say that for me, success is probably finding a way to take what you love and turn it into your livelihood, you know, and that doesn't mean to commoditize your passions, which is a huge argument in the creative industries, I think, where people just, you know, I'm not a commodity man, get off of me with your sales pitch or whatever. Stop talking to me about marketing. I'm an artist, you know, like I don't, I, I've definitely been on the, on both sides of that argument at this point, you know, Sure. and, uh, you know, it's not an argument worth having. I mean, it's, it's really kind of at the core of people doing art in the first place or anything that, that drives them to continue doing it. I feel like people are just instantly, you know, given an opportunity to find a way to make that their life and at the core of that love, they want to. So it's like right. the, the argument about uh, against it is just ridiculous for me. And so I just, just, again, don't fight it. Go with what you love and that is probably going to lead you to success. And so my definition in a, in a more, you know, specific kind of day-to-day sense would be to, to find a way to structure that, you know, to find a way to, you know, turn it into uh, something you can plan long-term and obviously there's a money component to the success question. And for a very long time, I only defined success by money. And frankly, like it wasn't until I started to kind of get the results that I wanted out of my art that I realized, well, no, there's kind of a different thing here. There's a different definition or a different perspective at least. Uh, and I, I, I'm around enough people so often between Hollywood uh, comedy and comics, there's so many people in those communities who are successful in their own right by branding themselves as an individual, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so to give you a couple of examples, and this might be a, a little bit of a hot, uh, hot bed example right now, but it's sort of creeping way, creeping back in. And that is, um, Chris Hardwick. I mentioned the Nerdist earlier as a podcast, uh, that influenced me hugely and, I stand behind that guy with everything that's happened personally. And I don't want to get into that. The whole situation sounded super shady and obviously I was appalled and scared and all that. Um, But it seems to me that it's like someone was railroaded and that's about all I will say. But if you look beyond that then you can go back to what started him and what he is, has become, I guess it's hard to say it has become because it was all torn down. So that's why it's a hot, hot example, but uh, I, I believe that he's a very powerful person who took exactly what he loves and figured out a way to structure it because, you know, he wrote a book called The Nerdist Way and it's largely about, yeah, you need to be better. You need to be healthier. You need to be more fit. You need to go after what you want in life and make more money. But you know what? Don't forget to play video games and you still should go to that comic book convention. So you got to find a way to kind of like balance all those things out, you know? Right. And, and that was always his approach. And I, and I took a lot from that because not only did he have a very easygoing podcast, uh, but he used that podcast to actually create this massive community that enabled so many creators. I mean, the Nerdist is still a company. It's owned by Legendary now, and he was, you know, he was bought out and chose to do his own thing at ID10T, which he was, I believe, intending to kind of replicate the Nerdist model uh, with. And then, obviously, this whole scandal thing happened, so who knows what's going to happen with that. But sure. the way that he managed his life for, I don't know, almost a decade, it was right in front of my face. He's a huge part of my community. So that would be one example. Um, but then obviously, uh, you know, on the other side, there's the, the creator side, the artist side. Um, and a couple people spring to mind, um, you know, uh, well, hell, I don't know. This is a hard conversation. Let me, let me edit myself without saying 20 names in a row. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to say that what I said earlier about branding oneself over the lifetime of a creative career, uh, there are a number of examples. I mentioned Will Eisner earlier. He's sort of the father of modern comics, if you will, because he was the first one that kind of took the stapled insert out of the newspaper and allowed, like, you know, wanted people to keep it as a separate thing. Uh, so if you look at that guy's career, there's a total signature to his art throughout his entire career, and you can tell it's his work. And he actually had a huge ownership on his work because it was, he established himself prior to the whole, like, big Marvel and DC kind of thing. So he was able to really retain that ownership. Um, but there are not very many people like him 
uh, in this weird interim period. It's starting to happen more commonly now because everything is, you know, personal brand now uh, and self publishing or self promotion. Now that's like the only way a lot of us can survive in this economy. Uh, but one of my favorite examples, I suppose, who has passed away at this point, but he, I mentioned him as well earlier and that's Mobius and Mobius uh, Jean Girard is a, a French illustrator who contributed heavily to heavy metal magazine. Uh, but he also contributed to Alien, The Fifth Element. Um, I, I can't think of how many movies he contributed to, honestly, off the top of my head. Quite a few if you look at his IMDb, but if you dig in the, uh, you know, import bins or the, you know, who knows, sometimes discount bins at certain comic shops, you can find his, his work at a, a relatively affordable price. But even at discount shops, sometimes it's still 25 bucks for like an old dog-eared graphic novel because the work is that valuable and he, he really managed to create this this signature over several decades i mean he was drawing up to the day he died i believe in his late 70s mm -hmm. and just like most comic book artists we just pretty much draw all the way to the end and right. uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna die right here uh but uh, <laughs> not anytime soon but i'm gonna just like all right so no but the, the whole thing to me is that when i see someone like mobius where there's just this this career-wide signature on his work you can actually in a lot of ways connect many of the stories he worked on and that is that is the nature of the french comic book industry for instance where you know he would he would frequently work with alejandro yodorowsky who's you know probably best known for holy mountain and then that crazy documentary about the the dune film adaptation that he almost made that thankfully he didn't even though it would have been nuts uh but they constantly work together but still with another writer the work totally reflects Mobius' own sensibilities, and there are reflections within the actual stories and characters that create this overall, you know, kind of not interconnected directly, but everything is in the same family over a very long, healthy career producing a ton of art. Even if he changes style around a little bit, you could still just feel like you're in the same universe. So I have a lot of affection for that. It's, it's highly inspiring to me. Somebody who is currently working like that is another guy named Bill Sinkovich, uh, or it's spelled Sinkiewicz, but it's pronounced Sinkovich, and it's Sinkovich on Twitter if you want to follow him. He's one of the most incredible comic book artists. How do you, how do you spell that? I'm just taking some show notes. Uh, S-I-N-K-E-V-I-T-C-H, I believe, on Twitter. Okay. Um, and uh, it's the more, I believe, Polish spelling uh, in actuality. I'm not going to take a stab at that on your podcast. Uh, <laughs> I don't have one of his comics sitting near me, but he's somebody who's been working for a very long time. Ironically, I didn't mean to connect this, but he did the Dune film adaptation comic book way back in the day. So not to connect him to a previous mention, but uh, he, the reason I'm, divine, I'm bringing him up as success, for instance, and Mobius um, is because these are people who can sit down and do the thing in an instant. It doesn't matter what the tools are in front of them or what the circumstances are in front of them. And when you look over their you know, library of work, it all has, again, just it all holds together like a very clean fabric and signature of one person's work. And, you know, frankly, spirit, because there's a lot of passion that's put into that. And when somebody's able to just put it down on the page instantly and they don't have to think very hard about it or stress about it or make it precious, it's incredible to watch. So those people inspire me constantly. Um, but since this is a business show, and I'm sorry to go on for so long. No, man, this I, is really good. I want to mention Seth Godin. Yeah. He He's one of my go-tos. I'm sure you're familiar with him. Knowing oh, yeah. what, what he actually, do. he. I, I will say that I have emailed him numerous, numerous times over the years since I first came across his work, and there has never been a time he hasn't responded. No kidding. Yeah. That's awesome to hear, man. Yeah, he's it's one of I mean, those never meet your heroes things where. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. always it's always, you know, it's never been like these really long, drawn out emails. It's kind of like, hey, Seth, you know, here's something I ran into with my business or with a client or whatever. And, you know, do you have any thoughts? And even if it's like a just a word of encouragement or a book recommendation or um, he like gave me a discount on on his marketing seminar type thing. And, you know, just stuff like that, where it's just like he's just a generally good dude. So mm -hmm. yeah, go for it, man. Cool. Talk him up. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he's got this great new podcast, Akimbo, that I just love. I'm loving the way love it's it. structured. I love it. And you know, it's just like his blog. I, and I mentioned this in one of my episodes not too long ago because I didn't really have any guests for a while. I just kind of 
I ran out of energy, frankly, in the podcast. So I just started to kind of plug like what I was reading, what I was listening to or whatever. And, and his podcast is incredible and everything he's ever done, you know, the startup business school is incredible. Um, I probably listened to that podcast series, which is like 15 episodes. I probably listened to that seven times maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, the way that he presents everything is short and sweet. And speaking of the Tao Te Ching, that really attracts me to his style of writing because the Tao Te Ching, what's really cool about that book is that it's written kind of like a series of poems. I mean, they're not, they're not, right. they don't rhyme, but they're verses. And so you turn each page, there's like 10 to 15 lines. Sometimes they're two pages, but they're, they hit it home. I mean, the language is so clear and so crisp. And in this particular translation by Stephen Mitchell that I say, Mm -hmm. uh, that I've read, I don't know how many times, hundreds, I'm not even kidding. Uh, It's just so quintessential in the way that it gets the message through and there's no force about it, which would obviously go against the philosophy. Um, There's no religion about it either. And and so when I read Seth Godin, that's kind of strangely what his style is because he's not dogmatic. He's not like, I'm right. You're wrong. Let me tell you. Let me tell it to you how it is. Like I hate that stuff. And you know, I I've listened to most of the entrepreneurial podcasts out there, and some of them are very good, but they're so niche and so specific. And like these guys want to live such specific lives. Like you want to live in the Philippines and only work four hours a day. Good for you. I'm an illustrator. I don't want to do that. I want to know how to make this thing work for me. You know what I mean? Um, So Seth Godin is amazing because he's all about you know, kind of finding what works for you, not trying to be false, trying to be honest, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then trying to outsmart the noise. Right. Which, which I, I, there's no way I could sum up his philosophies about that because I think he comes up with a new one every couple of days. Yeah. You know, like, have you read, um, have you read purple cow? I have not read purple cow yet. It's on my, on my list, but you know, so many are (laughs) that one. (laughs) I honestly, I feel like that, that one has probably been, um, that one in the dip, are, are the two that I would say have um, have summed up uh, a lot of his work. I mean, maybe yeah. maybe three. The, that one, The Dip, and um, Tribes. Um, and in Purple Cow, it's basically the concept of if you're driving down the road, you've never seen cows before, and you're with your family in the car, and you see some cows on the side of the road, you'll, you'll probably pull over, take some pictures, and maybe you're from the city or something, you know? Um, but then you get back in the car, and then continue driving. And if you see more cows, you're not going to stop again. However, if you see a purple cow, <laughs> you're going to stop again, even though you've seen cows before. And so his the whole book is essentially how you can be the purple cow in your space or your industry or, or whatever. So for me, um, that's that's why I do this this Facebook live show, you know, with this kind of space ghost coast to coast vibe to it, because it's like there's like you said, there's all these entrepreneurship podcasts. There's all these people who are talking to amazing people and having amazing conversations. But I'm like, how can we have more fun with it? How can you know, yeah. my friend Brent, uh, who's who's probably watching, um, he's a, he's an illustrator Hi, also. Um, he, he, you know, some of these little creatures that are, um, occasionally animating down here, uh, I can make one of them blink out. See that guy right there. Um, oh, I didn't even notice that. Nice. Yeah. So, um, he, he's a, he has helped me create all kinds of cool stuff. And so I'll, let me pull one up here real quick and see if it, uh, see if I can show a quick example. Um, it's going to kind of mess up the, the scene a little bit, but so like here, for example, you know, this is a, a background that he cr- helped create for, you know, me helping to promote my book and stuff like that. Um, and anyway, These are fun. yeah, so a lot of it is is leaning into that purple cow concept and leaning right. into this whole idea of how can you take something that a lot of people might, um, you know, might look at as uh, pretty typical but really own it in your own creative way. And I think that that's Mm -hmm. something as entrepreneurs that a lot of times people don't really think about. Um, And so Seth's work has been uh, immeasurably valuable for me in that regard, so. Same here, exactly. I don't think I would have gone with a company named Monkey Gong if it weren't for (laughs) Seth. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, actually, Um, I'm I'm curious. Uh, Talk talk a little bit about that. What, What was it that inspired you for that? Well, I don't know where it initially came from. I mean, initially I just did this drawing like on the corner of an old drawing table, kind of like this one, Mm -hmm. where I just doodled this organ grinder monkey with this holding a gong, kind of like this and just just banging the crap out of it (laughs) with this, you know, like just kind of Asian style, you know, gong mallet. And uh, 
I don't know where it came from initially. And if you go to my website, that's down at the very bottom of the homepage. There's a, there's a redrawing of it. That's not the original because the original I did in pencil on a desk, like desktop, like this one. So just over time, just kind of smeared off, you know. Right. And so, but I, but that means that I looked at the thing for, I don't know, however long it took to smear off. Literally, I couldn't I couldn't tell you. It could have been a year or two even. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, kind of like my dumb. There's a dumb like Superman emblem up here that's just a piece of tape that tore like a Superman emblem by accident. So because I'm a nerd, I had to like draw the Superman S, <laughs> which stands for hope it does. On, uh, <laughs> on it. And then that's been there for a couple of years and is now rubbed off almost entirely. So that's <laughs> just to give you the real life story of how these things work behind the scenes. Um, no, uh, so I don't know what where the name came from, but when I came up with the name, I was like, well, one, it's got a fun ring to it. I like stuff that's weird. I, I told Malik actually mm -hmm. when he was on my podcast that I love to create like I'm a four year old sometimes. Like sometimes I just love it when an idea comes across my brain where I'm like, that is so off the wall and it doesn't fit in anything I've ever seen. And it's kind of juvenile maybe, but it's also really creative. So like, right. why wouldn't I? And so usually if I, if I am, if I do my work properly, in my opinion, those weird ideas just kind of they play way better and there's a lot more fun being had in the creation process. So I just don't get stuck, you know, and which, which speaks to why I'd love to do more of my own work and, and do less client work is because when I'm able to do that and create that way, it's pretty fun. But, um, so monkey gong as a word, if you will, it means my primal alarm clock, like mm. my monkey, I'm a monkey. And the gong is like my inner alarm clock going off, telling me like, it's time to, you know, do my thing and and really the reason i chose it i think is because i was a bartender when i really set the brand up about six years ago or so seven years ago maybe um so i ran it for a little while while i was bartending still and i was still living in san francisco and i just finished art school and uh well finished art school <laughs> and uh <laughs> so i don't know it really seemed like the thing because it was like i just really needed to get out of the restaurant business i'd been in the business for 17 years and i was kind oh, wow. of done and well, 16, we'll say at that time. And then, so, you know, I created the name. It was, all, it was already there in my subconscious. My subconscious did the work a long time ago to, to provide me with the right thing. And it feels creative enough and it's weird enough that I feel like it's kind of hard to forget once you get in your head. Well, yeah, so. I was, I was going to say, like, I remember whenever I first heard heard about you through, um, I heard about you because uh, Malik did your podcast and so that's mm -hmm. how i i connected with you and i was like monkey gong that is not something i'm going to forget yeah uh, so exactly and actually uh you know i have to say just really quick shout out to malik that mm -hmm. is one of my favorite episodes of my show hands down yeah it was really good so uh if you haven't heard that episode of the storycraft podcast and you're interested in checking it out not to self-promote start oh, no, with the you, malik you can... episode because it is fantastic i will um, um i'll put that in the show notes also here um so really, I don't know. I just, I just kind of realized what the brand was a while back. And then it was kind of the podcast came next. And then the science fiction thing actually came third. Okay. Uh, but that's when the brand started to make sense hmm. because uh, I had drawn this crazy monkey illustration and some kid asked me where the comic was with the monkeys as characters. And I was kind of like, that's a really obvious question. And I'm kind of dumb because I never really thought about making that into a comic. But I had already been doing other science fiction things. And so I just let that ruminate for a little while. And I came up with what is soon to be my webcomic Sojourners that will probably launch in two or three weeks from the time of this episode. Very cool. And, uh, you know, you can you can just go to Monkey Gong and there's plenty of info about that. Um, so, you know, that's uh, about space monkeys and all that good stuff. And basically, you know, science fiction, I guess, was the thread that started to tie it all together once that story became a little clearer. Um, yeah. And hmm. so... That's my brand. <laughs> cool. uh, yeah. Next question. Yeah. Awesome, man. Um, well, I mean, I know you already mentioned the 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 book by Stephen Mitchell, the translation of the Tao. Mm -hmm. But um, do you have any other books that you would say have been really instrumental in shaping your creative slash entrepreneurship career? Uh, yeah. I mean, I wish that I had done a little bit of prep on this because I would love to just give a shout out to Stephen Pressfield for The War of oh, Art. Excellent, excellent book. Uh, and the follow-up, uh, the name of which totally escapes me. The Artist's the Journey. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that so, just came out. 
Yeah. Yeah. And which, by the way, those books have a very Taoist kind of approach to this whole thing. And I, I really am not prepared to talk at length about what specifically he says, but I will, uh, I will say that the collective unconscious or the the cosmic or universal element of putting your your intentions or your creativity, which is similar to the secret, by the mm -hmm. way, and all that stuff, uh, and 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 creative manifestation or uh, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. uh, I think that is kind of key to this. And and it doesn't matter what your religious beliefs are, because I kind of think we're all connected, no matter what your beliefs are. And there's definitely a certain wavelength. And I think that the what I find kind of interesting in addition to the fact that he talks very much about branding yourself and like doing what you're good at and following your passion and things like that, which are, those are just fundamental to me as a human. So like the first half of the war of art, I was like, I'm in love with this guy. He really says it like it is, you know, and he's able right. to, he's able to kind of break down why that's not a selfish thing, mm -hmm. you know, and how to lean into it as you're saying. And, and I think that, uh, I, I have to give that a lot of credit and, and it's all, you know, not being able to actually uh, talk too much in specifics makes me want to go back and just immediately listen to the audiobooks again. Uh, but I've already done it like three times and uh, it's more for me an absorption of the, the, um, the overall idea, the energy of the idea, if you will, sure. of pursuing this, this thing, you know, on that note, um, I, I won't, I won't draw any parallels. You can draw them if you'd like. Um, but one of the things that has always struck me about that book is uh, the the War of Art, his first one, um, mm -hmm. on the topic, um, is a story that he talked about when he was I don't know if he was writing his first novel, um, but he was working on a novel and he was in a really rough spot and he was having he was dealing with massive amount of resistance and trying to like really break through, yes. and he That's he nice. got to a point where he basically like locked himself in a room and was like I'm not coming out until this is done and he was in this this he finally kind of broke through that that resistance the distraction that all of us deal with as entrepreneurs as creators and he talked about how i think he heard nixon's predecessor taking the oath of office on the tv and someone's in, in the other room or something mm -hmm. and he didn't even know nixon had gotten impeached because hmm. he was so focused on making his idea happen while everyone else was like, you know, so distracted and all this other stuff. He was like, I can't, I can't control any of this. Right. Right. This is what I want to focus on my life's work. I can get stressed out about everything happening outside, but it's not going to help me, you know, get where I want to go. And so he talked about how he hit that space of like, of just pure focus and creative flow that yeah. he didn't even know Nixon had gotten impeached. And I was like, that that's what i want <laughs> like yeah all the yep, time. Yep, yep. well and that plays into what i was talking about earlier in like regards to having a job versus and i think maybe it was just before we recorded I yeah, can't remember now. We okay so before we recorded i talked about how when you have a job that job sort of by nature structures you from uh, i'm sorry protects you from the outside world because the nature of the structure of that corporate environment or whatever even if it's private you you know you have a job to do you have some oversight but i think when you're a creative it can be very challenging to to produce that level of oversight on yourself and to reduce distractions to a place where you can deal with them. And, and we're in a particular moment of national strife that is, you know, it, very parallel, speaking of Nixon, to those times and where uh, the trust in the government is very low and the trust in one another is very low and nobody knows who and what to trust. So it is uh, kind of important to not get too distracted by that and too wrapped up in that if you want to make something or keep just keep doing business i mean i think if you're if you're in the stock market you should pay a lot of attention to what's going on in the world because those people are trading like crazy right now because the world is insane and things are just flying back and forth you know and like the levels of things are just doing these huge spikes and then huge right. dives and it's insane what's happening with stocks right now but we don't work in stocks you right. know we work in creative things and you know not to make it political again, like sometimes there's family stuff that comes up that I think is incredibly challenging to work through. And it's been my biggest challenge in the last year or so to figure out how to get through very specific family stuff. That's really difficult and really distracting and kind of making me feel like stepping up in a way that uh, is stressful because 
if I had a corporate job, I would not need to step up at this point, sure. you know, but like sometimes when you're an entrepreneur, you're just barely getting by or, you know, you get, you do real well for part of the year, but you got to be careful. So you can't be traveling too much, but sometimes when family things are going on, you have to travel a lot. And so, sure. I don't know. It's just, uh, it's just one of those things where you got to learn how to have that structure for yourself and kind of shield yourself, but not miss out. And, it's interesting that he put it that way because my particular struggle right now is to not miss out and still get the work done. And I, and right. I, I agree with him. Um, but you reminded me, thankfully, since it's been so long since I've read those books, you reminded me that it's re resistance versus flow. Those are the two things he talks about. Yeah. And that definitely defines me as a creator in a nutshell. And like the, the defining of my in my inner personal resistance and, you know, outer resistances as well has been, you know, chief in my success. And it is kind of like the biggest focus of me right now for me right now, where I'm just trying to figure out, okay, how am I limiting myself? How am I standing in my way? Right. Are there external elements that are standing in my way? So, I mean, I definitely take a lot from that and, and, you know, I really appreciate what he has to say about that. Yeah. He also, he has another one, um, called turning pro that's, that's excellent. I feel like I bought that, but I haven't listened to it yet, or it's on my wish list on audible or something. Yeah, he's I mean, he his his work has been has been probably some of the most influential um, in my creative mm -hmm. career. Also, it's just nice. like you said, just very to the point. And it's like you read it and you, you're like, wow, yeah, it's exactly like that. And mm -hmm. and knowing I think at least for me, that's one of the reasons why I like doing doing this show and talking to other creators is because realizing, oh, we're all the same. Like we all have these same struggles. We all deal with the mental noise and the drama mm -hmm. of like, am I good enough? Am I not good enough? What am I going to do? You know? Um, and just knowing that, that there are, there are tactics and tips and, and ways that you can get through it, but also recognizing that it is part of the game. It is part of what you're going to deal with. And I think at least for me, when I got started, I wish somebody would have told me that when I first mm -hmm. got started. It was like, mm -hmm. listen, this is not, you know, you might see these people who are like super successful on Shark Tank or, you know, whatever. It's like they're trying to make entrepreneurship look cool. And it's like they don't show you the brutal side of it. They don't show you yeah. all the self-doubt. Yeah. They don't show you the the sleepless nights where you're like, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to put food <laughs> on the table? You know, yeah. should I yeah. just abandon all of this? Am I wasting my time? You know? Yeah, exactly. Why am I sick every morning? I can't figure it out. Right. Um, so real quick, I would like to kind of swing back and sure. talk about the podcast for a second, because yeah. you touched on something that reminded me, which is that like, I think it's extremely important to share this stuff. And, and one of the things that you mentioned was that it's not really talked about. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I was, t I was saying that about comics too. There's all this stuff that's not really talked about or taught. You know, like certainly when I was in uh, junior high and, art, and high school art classes, I was, I mean, not discouraged. Okay, yeah, one of my art teachers in high school discouraged me from making comics for sure. Sure. Uh, openly in front of the class, which, Ugh. you know, it's fine. <sighs> I, you know, she can she can do that all she wants. I'm still making comics. I don't right. care what she thinks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably partially doing it despite her, but not really. Uh, so no, but I think, I think it's really important to share this stuff. And that's why I think my podcast started to become more and more vital to me. And that's why it had multiple incarnations because when I first started the show, I was talking to a lot of comic book creators and it, it wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be as an experience. If you were going to listen to it, like what I was getting out of podcasts was way more vital. And so I was, I had to figure out how to take that informal element that I like where the really good laughs come from and some of the stories that you wouldn't surprise. I mean, I've, I've cried at podcasts. I don't know how many times, even some of my own episodes when I'm listening to a, a, a guest tell a story when I'm editing it. I mean, right. I have one episode, my friend, Aaron Lim talks about her dad. It just crushes you. And, uh, it's, you know, that's an invaluable experience. And so you got to figure out how to like take that and retain it, but then put some structure on it and put these things that could potentially be didactic and like, kind of preachy, you know, and, and figure out how to spread the word about certain things. And so <laughs> finding the balance between preachy and like spreading the word and being part of a community has been a real challenge. You know, finding right. your voice is difficult. It's really easy to be in sound arrogant or sound cocky or be a douche, you know? <laughs> so like you got to make sure that you're, you're in it for the community. And, and I'm trying to be more for the community than, than for myself. And, and really when you, are working towards uh, success as an entrepreneur in the creative arts, 
it is about the community. And if you don't respect, respect your community, your community will not really allow you to succeed. Um, I mean, that's not to say you can't be independent and have your own fans or whatever, but uh, Twitter is a loud place. Right. So, well, have you have you um, have you read uh, Kevin Kelly's article, One Thousand True Fans? I have. It's been probably almost ten years since I've read it, but uh, I just bought the Audible because he reads it. So I'm gonna okay. listen to it again. But but that is actually kind of my aim, frankly. Like that's that's the whole thing when you, when it comes down to it. I mean. I started a podcast before I launched a comic, even though I felt like I was crazy doing it. And I've felt that way many times since then, uh, because I wanted to have an audience for the comic. And I didn't really right. want to, I self published a couple things before I started my podcasts. And I just felt like they're, they just go nowhere. Sure. You know what I mean, like you do a thing, you like, you show it off at a comic book convention, you can't get distribution in comic book shops because you're not printing a big enough print run, you know, whatever. You don't have money for marketing. I mean, prior to Facebook and things like that, there was no easy marketing right. uh, just at our fingertips. I mean, it was like AOL chat rooms at that point when I was <laughs> yeah, self-publishing yeah. my first stuff. So uh, not to age myself, but you know, I mean, it all moved pretty fast as far as social right. media. And like, so things really changed and, and it was the advent of podcasts uh, and social media or vice versa, I suppose for me that changed everything. Cause right. like Twitter, Twitter was what changed everything. I started listening to Kevin Pollock's chat show and the Nerdist and WTF and a couple of things. And I was like, wow, Twitter is really popular among these comedians. And then I started to kind of like, like get into Twitter a little bit deeper and I realized, oh yeah, okay. So now I'm following all the physicists. I like all the filmmakers. I like right. all the comedians. I like everybody in my comic book community. And you know, for me, it's actually a way more positive experience than you hear about on the news. Sure. Uh, it's led to so much success with my podcast so many guests so much heat on certain episodes it just i don't know i mean i, I kind of think it's social media is all about how you use it obviously facebook is one of those things where behind the scenes how you use it maybe doesn't matter because it still has a bit of a dark side but sure. uh you know maybe that'll improve over time while they uh you know work their problems out i guess but i, I don't know um I guess I kind of went off on a tangent. <laughs> no, man. No, but it's it's good. I think that a lot of it really does boil down to, like you said, it is it is these are tools that we have at our disposal, and it's our decision how we use them. It's our decision how we interact with our community. Um, and I mean, I I have connected with some of the most amazing, awesome people all around the world. Like there are people watching right now who the only reason I know them is because of Facebook. The only reason I know mm -hmm. them is because of some of these platforms. And so right. on that side of things, I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Um, exactly. Obviously I'm not a huge fan of, of some of the other things, but you know, it doesn't pay to focus on or get stuck on that. At least for me at this point in my life, I just can't, it's not worth it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. I, I'm trying to make this transition. I mean, I'm, I know we're going to probably talk a little bit about this anyway, but <clears throat> trying to make this transition, uh, to using social media just kind of for business. I mean, yep. I have personal interactions on it, but I'm really disappointed in, in Facebook, not just because of Facebook, but because of some of the people in my community on Facebook, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, most of my community is awesome, like 99%, but there's always, there's always that 1%, not to make a joke about <laughs> society, but there's always that 1% that just, they have to be dicks. And I don't, I don't understand why the platform needs to be that. And that's, that, that's my same problem with Twitter, but you know, it just is what it is. It just, I think Facebook is more one of those things where it's like sort of like an online constant high school reunion. And I, I think that there's a weird mentality that's coming along with that. And, 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 you know, the showing of so much of our lives on that has brought people to a level of comfort of sharing certain things or making certain comments that they do make in the comfort of their own living room. And I'm not talking about racist stuff. I mean, sometimes it's really simple stuff. Sure. But some stuff just to, you know what, like these are private thoughts, people like, let's just right. focus a little bit and we don't have to share everything. Life was better before we shared everything. Yeah. You know, um, life was better before we were connected via text a hundred percent of the time, yeah. you know, like we don't need to communicate about the minutia all the time. I really think that there is value to silence, you know, and value to some, some structure to things. I don't want the gatekeepers that ran everything before social media became a thing for sure. But I mean, some guidelines or some courtesy would be awesome. And yeah. I think that maybe it's just this, we're, we're in a grand reckoning in America right now. where It's like, we have to start acting better this yeah. period. Well, I think I, I, I'm, I hearken back to uh, the immortal words of Bill and Ted, you know, be excellent to, to each other. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ring. So, uh, yeah. So 
I'm with you on that. Uh, so really now it's just all about kind of structuring things in a way that's, I'm just trying to focus on brand and use, use the internet that for brand yeah. period. And that might sound impersonal or whatever, but no, I, but can... I think it's, it's also, it's important to look at it as, uh, as an element of self care at this point, yeah. you yeah. know, because yeah. there's people are going to do what they're going to do. And, and I, I struggle with it too. Like I, I, I have to be very careful. We talked earlier about, you know, daily routine. Like I have to be very, very intentional to not like wake up first thing and then grab my phone and check all the different inboxes and check Reddit and check and see all the drama. It's like, because then the, that creative space for me, I, I function best when I first wake up, if I get down, you know, sit down and I start writing or I start right. working on projects or whatever. But if right. I immediately fill my brain with everyone else's thoughts and everyone else's emotions and drama, because you're, you're scrolling on your feed and you can literally go from, hey, I'm getting married to, oh my God, my best friend just died. Or, you know, it's like, and totally. you're dealing with this constant thing. I don't think we were ever meant to, to handle that. It's, Even just the birthday prison, like, oh, so-and-so's birthday is today. And it's like, I feel like I got to, like, send a birthday greeting while I'm sitting on the toilet when I wake up. Like, right. I don't, you know, like, I don't want to do that. Sorry to, for the visual. But, like, yeah, it's, it's like, just one of those things where it's like, I mean, we get that visual of our president. It's better when it's me, right? Just kidding. Uh, so uh, it's just, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, you, you talked about what was my perfect day look like or whatever, my mm -hmm. ideal day. And I, and I think for me, it's like I wake up, I slam down the coffee and a breakfast burrito or whatever, and I'm listening to a podcast and I'm well on my way onto a drawing that's kind of my fun and formal for me drawing. And then I'm done with that. And then I move into like something for a client maybe. Right. And then, and then in the evenings I'm working on my business and, and somewhere in there, those things are resulting in, you know, a little bit of money coming back in, especially from retail, which is kind of, it's one of the things I'd love to plug in this podcast is that I'd love to sure. make some retail sales because I have everything available through my shop and on Monkey Gong. And well, it's a, and this is actually probably a good time because yeah. uh, we are right at a, hour, about two yeah. thirty here. So, yeah. um, so why don't you talk a little bit about you know how people can get in touch with you, um, any calls to action, anything that you're working on that you want people to know about? Go for it. <clears throat> Uh, well, you know, calls to action at this point, uh, just go to monkeygong.com and drop your email address into the email request and. Uh, that's your point to me for some reason. I, I am pointing at you, at the, but, but if I point too far, my hand gets cut off. That's what this pointing, microphone's actually here you're for. Pointing us. Right, <laughs> yeah, down pointing down right down there. I can't there. do it. Uh, <laughs> I'm having the mirror problem right now. So am I in my in my yeah, yeah. apartment too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, so yeah, go to Monkey Gong and and just drop your email address. I'm gonna I'm gonna send out an email list opt in probably at the end of the week. Um, and that will be to uh, opt into probably a Friday mailer or a weekend mailer that will remind you that I just put out two podcasts that week. It'll be a repeat viewing reminder and a story craft reminder. Um, and then, you know, repeat viewing always has the call to action to give us a repeat viewing challenge of a movie you can't stop watching. It can be a good movie. It doesn't have to be a bad movie. I wanted to reemphasize that. <laughs> uh, we like to talk about good movies, but we do like to have some controversy on the show. It's fun. Uh, so, uh, but I want to send out a mailer that basically says, Hey, I got a new, you know, shirt that I just put up in the shop or a new print that I just should put up in the shop or a, or a new book that I just printed and put up in the shop. Very limited edition, you know, and it's stuff that like, I'd rather it doesn't sit in the closet because I've only got 20 copies. I'd like to see it roll out. So sure. opt into that stuff for now, tool around in the shop. I'm very proud of the newest products in my shop. Uh, some of them, by, I say newest in a very loose term. Uh, I currently have something called Furthest Reaches that I just put in, and that is a 50 page black and white science fiction folio. And it is, uh, it's about five years worth of art, uh, just spread out. There's some comic book stuff like this Technopolis hmm. mini comic, there's cool. one of my upcoming projects. Um, there's the original art from something else that I'm going to show you in a second. So it's got the original black and white artwork. Um, but I'm really proud of this. I thought, I think it turned out, uh, really solid. Um, it's a Very beautifully cool. printed book. It's got color cover, color back cover. Um, very heavy weight. Uh, and I've only got like 15 of those left. So it's one of those things where it's like, I made it for Comic-Con as an exclusive. So it's one of those, Hey, get your Comic-Con exclusives if you didn't get to go to Comic-Con. Uh, so I also have, uh, odds and ends, which is, uh, let's put that a little closer to the yeah, camera. That's good. No, it's not upside down. He is upside down. Uh, this is a personal anthology of lost works, kind of similar to how this is a sketchbook. This is an anthology of comics that I did over the course of probably the last 15 years, maybe. Mm. Um, so hint, hint, Brent, hint, hint. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, because I, I, 
you know, I have a table at Comic-Con every year. I was very surprised when I got it last year. I didn't have anything new uh, that I was ready to print. So I decided to go through all my old work that I really liked and I felt like had been lost and just decided to print it and see if I could get some life out of it. And it was actually such an amazing experience. I printed it here at a printer called Short Run Printing in Phoenix. It's got a nice square binding on it. They did a really nice. beautiful job. Um, I'm having trouble finding my own work in my own book that I organized myself here, but I wanted to show you. Uh, this is a comic I did about uh, King David. So it's got lots of uh, Very cool. weird, you know, Jewish mysticism and uh, some, some battle scenes that are uh, possibly a little bit bloody. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's uh, something I'm pretty proud of. And I, I you know, I really like to uh, people who are sensitive to lambs and uh sacrifices don't look uh so you know there's lots of stuff in here um i'm trying to find just one more thing i guess to show you even the original monkey comic oh nice that i ever did and it's basically just saying oh hey i didn't see you were you came in i was too busy reading this comic it's just like a dumb <laughs> single page but uh <laughs> anyway so there's about uh 11 12 stories in here and uh that is 30 bucks but it's 100 pages so very it's cool. very heavyweight uh and your 30 bucks will get you a nice sketch and your 15 i'm sorry 20 bucks on this will get you in a sketch inside and I know this is shameless. I'm sorry, I'm promoting like crazy. I've never done this before That's what on a podcast you're here for, or whatever. Man. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Man. I, I don't do that on my podcast because I feel like an idiot when I do it. Uh, so the other thing that I have, uh, and I said I was going to show you the original art. I got a little glare going on here. So let me try to not get it. Works right here. All right, cool. So this is the oh. solar team. Yeah, see, there, there we go. go. This is the solar team uh, vinyl by DJ Roche. Very cool. Uh, and I did the artwork for that. And so uh, that's available in two forms. That's available for 30 bucks for the vinyl alone. And then it's available for 60 bucks with a very finished science oh. fiction drawing nice. on like really thick paper that comes along with it. So those are normally a hundred bucks for those drawings. Uh, but so here's the interior. Very cool, man. Here. Um, and, and honestly, like I know that I'm shamelessly plugging and I appreciate the opportunity to do that, but like, the whole thing is that the reason I have all this stuff sitting near me, it's like I've got coffee cups that are really awesome. I got mine here you know? too. Exactly. <laughs> so it's one of those things. Uh, it's more like I want to talk about branding. I want to try. I'm not trying to sell all this shit, but like I definitely. <laughs> I mean, yes, I am trying to sell all this shit. So please. Uh, let but, me. Brent said, "Can I switch you to full screen for some of these promos?" Let me see if I can do sure. that. Um, uh, right click. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Sorry. It might cool. break it might break things right now. I'll look into yeah, it. Yeah, let's next. not break it cuz we're already running long anyway. We don't want to break things. It's all good. Um, but I, you know, I just wanted like to to swing it back to talking about business for a real quick sure. second. Um, I mean, one of my favorite things that I've done is like at, at being able to be an entrepreneur with artistic skills is using my own work to just pump out branding, you know. Yep. Like, can't seem to get the left right thing right with the camera um you know so it's like uh you have every opportunity to do stuff like this when you're an entrepreneur and i think that i don't know what other people uh, have as an experience when it comes to branding themselves and creating you know the hands-on branding elements like that and i know a lot of that stuff is swag mm -hmm. that you just get like tossed at you at a convention or whatever and it's annoying and throw it in the trash but some i mean i'm trying to make it look fun and you know make a cool sticker here and there and you know just kind of have fun with it. And I, and I think that it's, it's really amazing that we live in a time where you can do that. You can do on-demand merchandise so easily yep. and uh, put yourself in a position where you're pretty heavily branded kind of even literally from head to toe, you know, yep. with your own stuff if you want to, because I see that you are literally, you know, and that's why, that's why I did this because like, this is, this is this. See? Oh yeah. Yeah. Very so cool. that's why, you know, I'm drinking, I'm drinking out where of this did coffee you, cup, um, sort of where ironically. Did you, where did you print the, the black mug? Because I have, I, you know, we do our mugs, but they're all white. Shopify. Oh, okay. Yeah. They have um, their own print on demand thing? Yeah, it's called Merchify. It's just an app that they own the company. It's their own thing. And then you can also get like Printful and stuff connected to Shopify. Yeah, I use, I use Printful for so, our stuff. So, you know, I guess in closing uh, for my shameless plug of all my merch and stuff, uh, all the comics are handmade. All of my prints are hand printed. So mm. none of that stuff is print on demand. This is all, and same with the vinyl. That's not print on demand. This is stuff that I have here and I'll be shipping that to you along with your original art if you buy any of that stuff. Um, 
and feel free to add the 30 bucks on top of any purchase to get a piece of original art, by the way, because I will always do that. And uh, even if it doesn't say it on the actual item that you're looking at. But anyway, to finish the shameless plug, I will just say that Shopify, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking for a way to run a shop, I'm doing a lot of comparisons between Shopify and Etsy because I've had Shopify for years and I'm looking at Etsy now because I'm trying to amp up my t-shirt sales. I've got some sure. awesome new shirts that I did not bring over here to show to people, but they're the first two shirts on the website, on the shop and on the slider on the homepage. It's a dog and a cat related shirt setup. So you'll you'll figure it out. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil that. But, but uh, my point is that, that I have half and half. I have a lot of stuff I make myself, but I, I have really essentially come to trust Shopify in terms of quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the quality of this mug, let's see if I can get it in the light here. Yeah, it looks good, man. It's super crisp, right? Mm -hmm. There is, there is the one item that they say it's dishwasher safe. I'm going to say it's not, you can see a little fading on this one. This, <laughs> one, this one's four years old. Wow. So I didn't even start for more than a year of being in the dishwasher. So it's like, but, but my point is that, you know, I've got shirts and all kinds of stuff that I make through them and I never sell any of them. And I feel like there's this trust issue that comes from on demand merchandise probably because I think for instance, like people shop through Redbubble all the time and by all accounts, it's garbage, you know, like something very simple works pretty well through Redbubble, but I've heard a lot of horror stories of the worst and I've gotten birthday presents where it's like, Oh, I sent you a shirt and I get it. I'm like, I don't know what that image was supposed to be, but it's right. not an image. So yeah, I just think I really trust Shopify and I'm, I'm kind of leaning into them to do the same things that Etsy does, which is, you know, you, you can create purchase funnels to Amazon and Google and oh, yeah, yeah. all those places. So, um, I don't know, that's where I'm trying to go with most of that, but I will always, uh, hand print my comics at a local printer, either here in Phoenix or wherever I end up living after Phoenix. So I guess that's pretty much what I've got. Please subscribe to both of my podcasts, Storycraft and the Repeat Viewing Podcast. Everything is available on Stitcher, uh, iTunes, and uh, Spotify. And Spotify is obviously new, and it's the easiest one for most people. So go ahead and give that a listen. Um, I'm very proud of both of those shows. So, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you, Craig. I really appreciate the time. I'm going to do a couple quick shameless plugs myself. So um, I, if you guys are interested in figuring out a way to monetize your ideas, I actually just published this book. It's called The Science of Getting Rich, How to Think, How to Act, and What to Do to Harness Your Creative Potential. It was originally published by a guy named Wallace D. Wattles, which is this looker right here. I'm trying to show you in the camera. My fingers are... There we go. Um, and so it is an excellent, excellent book all about how to monetize your ideas and bring your ideas to life. I've added my own commentary quite extensively throughout this, as well as um, about seven or eight pages of recommended reading uh, for books that have been really, really instrumental for me in my creative career. So you can find out more about that and pick up your copy for a discount of what I have it on Amazon for, uh, you can get it for 15 bucks at scienceofgettingrich.info. And also if you are interested in building your own brand and you've listened to this podcast and this episode and you're like, you know what, I want to, I want to do my own thing. I want to take my, my brand and my business to the next level. Definitely go to logos.reformdesigns.biz. We've got some branding packages that we're doing some deals on right now. So if you're just getting started all the way up to your larger business and you want a new logo and some videos and business cards and the whole nine yards, uh, you can find out more about that at logos.reformdesigns.biz biz and lastly if you haven't already sign up for my email list our vips list at reformdesigns.biz slash vips and you'll get a free copy of my first book stop wasting time and burning money how to crush procrastination and live the life of your dreams and craig here's a here's something you might find it find kind of funny if you guys look real closely it says written designed and published by aspiring number one new york times best-selling authors <laughs> so I love it. Um, yeah. it's, it's, uh, one of the ways that we can put that on there without getting sued. So, yeah. um, I love it. anyway, uh, that's cool. about, so, oh, yeah. you're going to, you're going to come on to my show very soon and okay. talk, uh, at length, especially about the new book. And, uh, cause I feel like there, there is a whole side of stuff we didn't really talk about, which is sure. 
kind of getting specific in the structuring of monetization. Well, yeah, and a lot of it, a lot of the interesting things for me in this book and the reason that I republished it, um, I actually initially came across it uh, at a really, really rough time in my in my life. Um, it was a number of years ago and didn't know how I was going to pay the bills and whatever. And so a lot of times when I'm in that kind of space, I'll go to like thrift stores and browse like old bookshelves um, or like really old used bookstores and stuff because you a lot of times find books that are out of print and stuff. Um, and I came across uh, an old copy of this and it was like, you know, the science of getting rich. That sounds really pretentious. And, um, but I picked it up. I was like, what do I have to lose? And I started reading it and the, th I, the guy wrote it originally in 1910. It was actually published before the Napoleon Hill book, Think and Grow Rich, which is kind of like a classic mm -hmm. in the entrepreneurship mm -hmm. space. Um, but a lot of similar principles, but a lot of it really is about, you know, getting a very vivid, clear mental picture of what it is that you want and meditating on that regardless of your outside external circumstances. And then once you, you know, create something of value and bring that into the world, then you basically create structure and systems to facilitate money coming to you. And so in my case, it was like, well, you know, if you're going to start a business, you need to have a business bank account. You need to mm -hmm. register your business with your secretary of state, you know. So there's like practical things that you can do where you're basically putting faith in the fact that, you know what, this is the direction I'm going, but I can't receive this stuff if I don't set something up to receive it whenever it arrives. Um, mm -hmm. And so he talks a lot about that as well as... Um, basically the difference in two ways of, of making money and, and generating wealth. There's the creative method and there's the competitive method. The competitive mm -hmm. method is the one that has caused most of the wars and strife and all of that BS in our world for centuries. The yep. creative method is, you know, me creating and you creating stuff that literally only you can create. Mm -hmm. And then you decide to establish a value on that and connect with a tribe of people who are willing to pay you for it. Um, that is, in least, at least the way I look at it, that's the only way to really achieve success that isn't the kind where you're constantly having to defend it because mm -hmm. you're creating your own stuff, building your own tribe, and you're not trying to take anything from anybody else. Yep. Um, and Can so, I, I know yeah. we're running long. Can I pick that up for one second? Yeah, do it, man. So that's one of the things that I have learned the most about people who are um, humble creators mm -hmm. because there's no competition. Like I have friends who are drawing Spider-Man, but I don't care. I don't want to draw Spider-Man. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like right. one of those things where you kind of realize that like when you lean into, and it's what I was saying earlier, when you lean into what you really want to do and what you're really good at, I mean, yes, there might be some competition. I'm not saying there's never going to, like if sure. you both want to draw Batman, by the way, there's only one Batman. <laughs> only one person can draw that. But like that's that's the whole point of what you're saying. That's not something only you uniquely can do. You might be awesome at translating Batman, but like when you really get down to it, if everybody is just doing what they uniquely want to draw in a comic book industry or whatever, it's a totally different landscape. Right. And it's sort of a fascinating thing to think about. And and frankly, there would still be plenty of comics like Batman and Superman and Spider Man because there's people who want to draw that stuff and they love to draw that stuff. So they they're hap they will happily take the torch and bear that torch until someone else is chosen or whatever. Right. So, but I really do believe that like you can kind of live in non competition if you lean into what is special and unique about you and your love. Right. I mean, it's it's really simple. There's a <laughs> there's another excellent book um, on that topic called um, Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, and so the concept is basically, you know, you, we, we all have heard the idea in business of, of sharks and, you know, how there's these sharks in the business world and there's all this really intense competition. And so in this, uh, it's basically the concept of, you know, whenever you're starting your own thing, instead of going into a red ocean that's full of the blood of your enemies and your competitors and all of this other stuff and people yeah. who have been consumed by all these sharks in existing industries, yeah. Um, you go and create your own blue ocean or find a blue ocean where there's not a whole lot of competition. And, and at least the way I've looked at it, it's like mm -hmm. one of the easiest ways to do that is do the, do the difficult personal and professional development work that's required to learn how to bring your own stuff out into the world because exactly. there's, there's nothing like it. I mean, it's exactly. like I can do this every day, all day long and not get tired of it because it's always something new. 
And, you know, I'm right. not trying to defend anything. I'm trying, I'm not trying to like set up some kind of structure or business and then like defend myself from my competitors because I'm not trying to compete with them. I'm trying to do this my own way because mm -hmm. I know at the end of the day, like the, the same concept of um, somebody like Emerald Lagasse or whatever, it's like he doesn't mind sharing how he does things and all his recipes because the odds of somebody getting into his space Mm -hmm. And doing it like he's doing it and putting him out of business is like zero. It's just not yeah. going to happen. Yeah. Um, he's not going to get beaten at his own game. It's and, still going to be an imitation no matter what. Right. So anyway, if uh, you're watching and you're hesitating to create your own thing, just stop it and just go do, do it. it. <laughs> do it. We're going to turn into Shia LaBeouf. You got a green screen. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Very cool, man. Very well, good. hey, um, that's about all for now. Um, if any of you guys have any comments or questions about the show, definitely let us know. Um, and thanks for watching. Craig, any, any final words, any, any last tips or pointers you'd like to share? Uh, I guess it comes down to don't use the art of war to, uh, you know, instill knowledge and understanding about your world. Uh, hmm. Use the war of art and the Tao Te Ching, you know, use hmm. the less forceful method it seems like we we've done the other one enough so try to find a way to use your happiness and your passion and and uh just follow what is good you know that's what i think very so, cool man thank you Ryan. awesome well thank you guys so much uh craig just hang on for a second i'll wrap this up um if you guys have any comments questions as always let us know and make sure to subscribe to our podcasts and our email lists and buy our stuff we'll love you forever i mean we'll love you forever anyway but it's we we love you more when you buy things no that's not true that's that's the complete opposite of what we were talking about but you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah. anyway guys uh <laughs> craig from monkeygong.com and i am ryan rhodes with reformdesigns.biz and that's all for today's episode and tune in next week i will be talking with my friend aaron from cards for connection um it's an excellent card game all about bringing the connection aspect back to our relationships instead of um, looking for ways to tear each other down. So we'll be nice. talking about that next week. And cool. that's all I have for today. Have a good day, guys. Cheers. Bye.